in four billion years. And I think that's just a very cool thing. Okay, so back to the Hubble Deep Field. The other thing that I really love about the Hubble Deep Field is that in the past 15 years or so, we now know that sitting at the center of most, if not all of these galaxies, is a supermassive black hole that ranges in mass typically from 10 to the five to 10 to the 10 solar masses. So up to 10 billion times the mass of the sun. And typically larger black holes sit in larger galaxies, but the black holes are about a thousand times less massive than the galaxies in which they reside. And one question that I get a lot is how do we know that black holes are there? If black holes are black, how do we know that they're even sitting at the centers of galaxies? Well, the best example that we have is the black hole in our very own galaxy, in our Milky Way galaxy. And that is the black hole that we call Sagittarius A star. And that's because the center of our galaxy is uh, you know, near the constellation Sagittarius. So Sag A star is the supermassive black hole at the center. And there has been heroic work in the past few decades to track the trajectory using very uh, powerful infrared ground-based telescopes like the Keck telescope in Hawaii to track the trajectory of individual stars near the center of our Milky Way galaxy. And what I'm gonna show you now is a movie since 1995, you'll see the time uh, increasing in the upper right-hand corner. And you'll see these stars, all of those colored um, points are stars, and they seem to be orbiting something. So this is, should be a movie that starts. Do you see that yet? Yeah. And look at this star coming in, and it just gets whipped around by something. We see full orbits, in some cases, of these stars moving around some object that we actually don't really see, that we can't see directly. But because of you know, gravity, we can use Kepler's laws, which maybe you'll learn about uh, in some of your, when you, your first year mechanics classes. And you can think about what is the mass, what mass does that central object have to be to explain the orbits that we see? These very kind of some massive object, a star comes in and it gets whipped around. What kind of a mass object does that central object need to be? And it turns out that it needs to be something that is four million times the mass of the sun. It also has to be something that's incredibly compact. And when something is so dense, so compact, that in order to escape its, for light even, anything to escape its gravitational pull, you'd have to be going faster than the speed of light, then that's a black hole. So it's because it's this object, we know it's very compact and it's very massive, it must be a black hole. And it turns out that even though we can't track the trajectory of individual stars in other galaxies, they're too far away, still we can track the motions of bulk, bulk motions of stars in the centers of other galaxies. And we find that similarly, they too must be um, orbiting around a, um, a central black hole. And what we find is this empirical relation that we call sometimes the M sigma relation, that the mass of the central black hole on the y-axis scales with the mass of the bulge of the galaxy, the mass of the galaxy. And that's a pretty good correlation by astrophysical standards. And what it's saying is that even though the mass of the black hole is like a thousand times less massive than the mass of the galaxy, like energy, you know, the black hole is puny 
compared to the mass of this very large galaxy. And yet somehow the black hole and the galaxy know about each other. The galaxy, in fact, there's evidence to suggest that the, the, the causation of this correlation is that the galaxy is actually dictated the, by the evolution of that supermassive black hole. The black hole at the center, even though it's much smaller, is responsible for, for how that galaxy evolves over time. And the reason for that is something that we don't fully understand, but we know that it's related to the fact that when you throw stuff into a black hole, when you throw a lot of gas into a black hole, it releases an incredible amount of energy. In fact, it's the most efficient energy production mechanism in the universe. And what we see is things like this, things like 3C273. This was the first, what we call quasar, first accreting supermassive black hole ever discovered. And by accreting, I mean just a lot of material is falling into that black hole. And what you see, this is another telescope image from the, the Hubble Space Telescope. 3C273 is that central bright object there at the center. And you see those kind of crosshairs. And that's an artifact of the telescope. It's from the support structure of the Hubble Space Telescope. But when really it, was, it Hubble is, is only babe, able to resolve that as, you know, just as a point source. You can see it, there's another point source at the top left of that image, and that's a foreground star. That's a star that's in our galaxy. That star is a million times closer than 3C273. And yet you see, it actually looks that 3C273 is brighter. And so that means because the luminosity or the, the brightness of something f falls off as um, the distance squared, that means that intrinsically the luminosity of that quasar 3C273 must be a million squared times, 10 to the 12 times more luminous than that star, in that foreground star. And so, that's just kind of telling you, giving you an idea of how much radiation can come from this process of shoving material into a black hole. The other thing that you may notice is this, if you go to the kind of four o'clock from the center of the quasar, you'll see a kind of a line coming out. And what that is, is a relativistic jet produced from the inner regions of that black hole, maybe even tapped from the spin rotational energy of that black hole. And it produces this relativistic jet that can, that can um, basically come out to size scales that's moving at close to the speed of light and can be punched out from the black hole and, and become as large as even the entire galaxy. And so this is an idea of, of you know, these relativistic jets are uh, just a hint at how black holes can um, kind of dissipate energy on much larger scales, affecting galactic scales. So let's now zoom in to the innermost regions of that black hole. If we could do that in these quasars, these actively accreting black holes, what would it look like? Well, this is an artist's interpretation of that region. And what you see is that central dark point is the black hole itself. And the material, it doesn't just, you know, kind of, it doesn't just fall in every which direction, spherically, you know, radial infall. Instead, it falls via an accretion disk. Material always wants to fall you know, through this accretion disk. 
And one reason that you can think about why that's happening is, you know, think about a black hole. I have a black hole in my fingers right here, just a, a point mass. And I have another point mass, a particle of gas that I want to just aim directly. I just want to throw it and I want to aim it directly into that black hole. What are the chances that I'm actually going to be able to hit that black hole? Really slim to none because this black hole is just so, so tiny. Instead, what's going to happen? I'm going to throw it and the gas will kind of get whipped around like those stars, right? Due to the gravitational pull of the black hole. And so one particle of gas will get whipped around. Another particle of gas, all of these particles of gas will get whipped around. They'll start interacting, hitting each other. And eventually everything starts moving together with the same angular momentum, right? Conservation of angular momentum causes all of this material to start moving together, forming what we call an accretion disk. That is the material falling through an, a disk. And the particles of gas, they're moving very quickly, um, close to you know, maybe 20, 30% the speed of light when you get very close to the black hole. And that gas is moving, you know, there's a lot of friction between the gas. And that, that accretion disk gets extremely hot so hot that it radiates light. And so that quasar emission that you saw on the last image from 3C273 is produced from this process of an accretion disk getting very hot and radiating light. And so this is one of the questions that I'm most interested in, in understanding is how do black holes affect galaxies? We know that the, we, there's evidence that the black hole is dictating how the galaxy evolves. And how, do you, how does that process happen in detail? How is it that we can shove material into this black hole through this accretion disk and it leads to this incredible amount of energy released outwards in the form of radiation through that you know, hot material in the accretion disk? through the, the, the launching of these relativistic jets, how does this process happen in detail? And that is where we get to tidal disruption events. So tidal disruption events are this amazing opportunity where you say, okay, we wanna understand what is the effect you know, of this black hole? What happens when you throw something into a black hole? And tidal disruption events offer you a chance. It's just a single star falling into a black hole. And so we can say, we can watch this happen. It's a cause and effect thing. We know that a black hole a star or some portion of a star has fallen into this black hole. What's the radiation? What are the jets? What's the energy that's released outward? And so that's where we're gonna go next. Um, but I think this is a good place to take a brief pause and I can answer a few of your questions before moving on to tidal disruption events. So Richard, do you want to, um, I see that there are a bunch of questions. Um, oh, and I see that they have a bunch, some have, they have the like function so I can I can answer some of these ones that have a lot of likes. Mm -hmm. In the movie Interstellar. Oh yeah, right. Everybody wants to know about how reliable is this image from Interstellar? Yeah, CGI artists simply plugged in black hole equations. Yeah, so the the interstellar actually did an amazing job at producing that image of a black hole and it wasn't just cgi artists deciding you know that they thought this was what a black hole looks like 
they actually made what we call um, ray tracing simulations of uh, how light, how light rays will move in a gravitational potential well of a supermassive black hole. So what they did was to um, take a black hole, you know, they say this is the, the black hole, this is how the space-time curves according to Einstein's field equations. And this, we're going to put a flat or razor thin accretion disk, a very skinny accretion disk, and light coming from that accretion disk around that black hole. And if we turn on all of those GR effects, all of those general relativistic and special relativistic effects using Einstein's equations on, we'll see that actually you get these, you know, light bending around the black hole. So you can see the back side of that black hole, the light from the back side of that accretion disk being bent into our line of sight. And so actually, Interstellar did a really good job, a very accurate description of all of those general relativistic effects. One thing that they didn't include was, you know, if you have an accretion disk, right, and that accretion disk is rotating, the light coming from the side of the accretion disk that's coming towards you there are special relativistic effects and you, you know, probably many of you, most of you have not taken special relativity, but that will mean that the light coming towards you, it's a, like a Doppler shift. You all have heard sirens coming towards you, right? The siren, the, the, the frequency of the siren is, um, you know, it's higher pitched when it's coming towards you and lower pitch when it goes away from you. That same effect, it will happen, um, you know, an analogous effect happens due to special relativity. And in that case, the light coming from, you know, towards you will actually be beamed towards you. It should be brighter. The light from the approaching side of the accretion disk should be a lot brighter than the, the light from the side of the accretion disk that's moving away from you. And originally, that effect was included in these ray tracing simulations for the movie Interstellar. But the um, director of the movie, when he saw this, he said, why is one side of the disc brighter than another side of the disc? That doesn't make any sense. And he said, okay, let's just get rid of those special relativistic effects. So when you look at that interstellar black hole, that accretion disc, it has all these cool light bending, warping effects, but it does not include the special relativistic effects of that moving accretion disk. So, how did the supermassive black hole form at the center of a galaxy? Or did a galaxy form around a supermassive black hole? That is an amazing question. And it's one that we actually are actively studying right now. We don't understand. That's one of the biggest questions in astrophysics these days is how do you get a black hole to be a million or a billion times the mass of the sun in the first place? You know, the only way that we know how to make a black hole is through the collapse of a massive star. There's a massive star way bigger than the mass of our sun and it's doing fusion at its core. And it's supporting itself because it's doing fusion at its core. And it's supporting itself from the, it won't collapse onto itself because it's producing energy outwards, being balanced by fusion. But at some point, it can't do fusion anymore because it runs out of fuel. And so then gravity takes over and just it collapses into a black hole. It also produces a supernova explosion but at left at the center is a black hole that's maybe 10, 20, 30 times the mass of the sun. And that's the only way that we know how to make a black hole. And yet we see kind of everywhere black holes that are a million or a billion times the mass of the sun. And that is one of the biggest questions in astrophysics. How do they get so big? And even more puzzling, one of the puzzles that I love so much is that when we look back, 
using images like that Hubble Space Telescope image, um, the Hubble Deep Field, or even, even further than the Hubble Deep Field can go. We look back to the black, the very earliest galaxies that were formed when the universe was less than a billion years old. The universe is 13.8 billion years old now, but we can look back to very distant galaxies when the universe was just 600 million years old. And those galaxies host some of the biggest black holes that we see of in the entire universe, 10 billion times the mass of the sun. But they only had less than 600 million years to form. So how is it that you go from, if you know black holes are formed through this collapse of a massive star, how do you go from something that's 10 million times the mass of the sun to some, uh, 10 times the mass of the sun, or maybe up to 100 times the mass of the sun, to something that's 10 billion times the mass of the sun in just a few hundred million years? which by astronomical standards is very short time. And actually, I'm gonna to get to that one possible avenue for explaining how these black holes got so big um, in the next portion of my talk. It's called Super Eddington Accretion. Basically, we need to make black holes grow faster than we thought is theoretically possible in order to explain how, how these supermassive black holes could grow from accretion. And I'll talk about that next. Um, yeah, so maybe I'll take one more question and then we can... Um, why is it that the relativistic jet emitted from the accretion disk is concentrated in one direction rather than being spherical or cylindrical, spherically or cylindri uh, cylindrically symmetric? That is an amazing question as well. Well, first I should say, we don't actually understand the details of the process that forms a relativistic jet. That's one of the things that I love about astrophysics is that there's still so many unanswered questions. There's a lot of room for people to make progress, but the thing that you noticed that you pointed out there is that there's only it was only on one side. Shouldn't you expect at least that the like the black hole will produce if you have an accretion disk like this? It turns out that um, you know matter is going inwards, and it's, it produces these relativistic jets. And maybe you it makes sense. You can understand. Okay, it takes kind of that that energy released outwards kind of takes the path of re least resistance. It goes out perpendicularly from the the black hole from the accretion disk. Why does it look like it's only in one direction? Shouldn't it produce jets on on both sides? And the answer is that yes, and it does. We think that. It does, but this is another one of these fun, special relativistic crazy things. It's actually the same answer to the, um, the same explanation as for the case of the interstellar black hole, that when you have a jet that's kind of pointed towards you and a jet that's point pointed away from you, these special relativistic Doppler shifts, these Doppler effects, will will beam the light towards you. And so the, the emission from the side of the jet that's coming towards you will be much brighter. And the emission coming from the, the side of the jet going away from you will be dimmer. And so it's not that, that these are like asymmetric systems in any way. It's that we can really only see the brightness from the one that's approaching us. Really good question. Excellent questions all around. Okay, I'm gonna move on and hopefully we'll have time for questions at the end. All right, so tidal disruption events, what are they? As I said, tidal disruption event is when a star gets too close to a supermassive black hole and gets ripped apart by the strong tidal forces. So just like the tides that you know, um, you know, when you go to the beach, this is the same, this is due to the, the kind of the, the effect of the, you know, being closer or further from um, 
the the moon it's at a certain time right these like kind of differential gravitational effects right this is the same idea happening in a tidal disruption event the image on the left is showing a schematic of what we think is happening that central point and unfortunately i think that you can't see my mouse anyway that central dot at the cent at the bottom of that image is the black hole and a star comes in on a um, you know or orbit like a parabolic orbit and at some point what we call the tidal disruption radius the gravity the tidal forces from the black hole are stronger than the, the self gravity of the star that means that you know the this star is coming towards the black hole this side towards closer to the black hole feels a much stronger gravitational pull than the back side of the star, and it causes the star to rip itself apart. It just gets what we call spaghettified. It becomes a piece of spaghetti. It becomes this debris stream like that. And so you see that after it gets closest to the black hole, some of that stellar, it gets disrupted at this tidal disruption radius. And half of that stellar debris will continue on its original parabolic maybe hyperbolic orbit unbound from gravitationally unbound from the black hole and about half of that stellar debris is bound gravitationally bound to the black hole and it falls back towards the black hole and eventually will accrete onto the black hole and the plot that i'm showing you on the right is DMDT, this is the fallback rate, how much the rate at which that, that bound debris falls back towards the black hole as a function of time. And so what you see is that at early times, there's this, that fallback rate increases very fast, very dramatically, rises to peak, and then decays slowly over the timescales of several years with this canonical t to the minus time to the minus five thirds power, which you don't have to remember. What you see on the, that line there indicated that says Eddington rate, that Eddington rate is for a million solar mass black hole. This is for, for the case, this is, um, this is the theoretical limit for how fast you can grow a t uh, hundred, uh, a million solar mass black hole. And what you see is that fallback rate, that stellar material falling towards the black hole, is coming at rates that are a hundred times faster than we thought is theoretically possible for how you grow a black hole. And that's one reason that people are so excited about tidal disruption events, is that they can potentially help us understand how it is you grow a black hole at these super Eddington rates, these very high rates, which may be important for understanding how those black holes, those supermassive black holes formed in the very early universe when the universe was less than a billion years old. Now I'm going to show you, this is just a little bit of a, a movie that the NASA press office put together. Do you see this movie? Oh no, I'm sorry, the movie is let me see if I can make that work by hand. Yeah, somehow I can evolve it with, <laughs> with my mouse. What you see here, there's a black hole sitting at the center here and a star, a single star comes in and at the tidal disruption radius, it gets ripped apart and half of that stellar debris will fall towards the black hole Eventually, it will form an accretion disk and it becomes very bright and our telescopes see a rise in luminosity. And that's a basic idea. So what is it that we actually see? I think that it's still incredible that we see this happening at all. We see, we can't resolve an, uh, you know, a movie like you, the one that you just saw, that was an artist's representation. But what we do see is that a supermassive black hole sitting in the center of a galaxy 
it's what we before we call it a quiescent black hole not a lot of material falling into it like the sag a star sagittarius a star the epicenter of our galaxy not a lot of material falling into it and so it's not very bright what we're showing you here is the brightness of that light as a function over time and so at early times you get these upper limits no emission no, no detection of light at all and then all of a sudden this is uh, these different colors are lights in different wavelengths all of a sudden it becomes very bright comes to some peak and decays over time over long time scales with in the similar way as the fallback rate as you saw that theoretical fallback rate of the material falling as this time to the minus five thirds power and these days we we see um you know we've seen about well this is a slide from a couple of years ago we've seen about two dozen at that point two tdes detected per year but now we have this new instrument called the Zwicky Transient Facility. It's an optical off-sky monitor, just like looking, scanning the sky every couple of nights. And in this year alone, we found 17 tidal disruption events. So what that corresponds to, the intrinsic rate, you know, we observe 17 per year. So how many does that mean that are happening in the universe uh, at any one, you know, in a given year? And it turns out that on average, once a tidal disruption event, once every 10,000 years in a galaxy, a star gets too close to a black hole and gets ripped apart. And once every 10,000 years is actually pretty frequently. So they're, they're not a rare phenomenon. So that's TDEs. And then the last couple of minutes, I'll tell you about one particular TDE that I um, love and that I've worked on. It's called Swift J1644. We want to understand how material, how that stellar debris falls into the black hole at these rates that are higher than theoretically what we thought was possible. So this is Swift J1644. Uh, Again, one of these light curves, we call them, the brightness over time. You can see it, it had a fast rise and then it falled, decayed over time in the X-ray X -ray light now you're seeing. This is an X-ray image of Swift J1644. And uh, it just looks like a blob. It's not resolved. All of those little kind of lines coming out from that is just, again, artifacts due to the instrument itself. It just is basically a point of light, not resolved. But we want to think about what does it look like we still want to understand what does it actually look like when a black hole turns on, when you start shoving material into that black hole. And since we can't image it directly, we need to get a little more clever. And we need to think about how do we see without imaging. And so the technique that I've been developing and um, pursuing in my research is called reverberation light echoes, seeing without imaging. And I think the idea is kind of intuitive to all of us because we all know about echoes, echoes of sound, right? So if we were in a room together, like in this schematic, right, you would hear my voice directly, the sound coming directly to you, but you would also hear my voice echoing off of walls, right? And if you could measure, and you know that that time delay, right, between my voice directly and the echo is just due to the time that it takes sound to travel and bounce off of the wall and then into your ears, right? So if you could measure every echo off of a wall and you could measure okay that's the direct sound and all of the subsequent echoes maybe multiple echoes back and forth off of the wall if you could measure every echo because you and you measure the time delays of those echoes multiply those time delays by the speed of sound 
then you know the distance to the wall. You could completely map out this room because of all of these sound echoes, right? So this is a basic idea. This is bats use echolocation to map out a dark cave. Um, you know, it's, it's a technique that we use all, all the time. This is the same thing that we have been developing to do now with light, light coming from the accretion disks around black holes. And so it's a little bit more complicated than uh, that simple sound description that I described. Um, it's not just a, a bounce and a real echo. What we're, what's happening is actually photo excitation and de excitation. That is, we have some light, you know, take this schematic that we have at the bottom here, some light coming from close to the black hole. Some of that light comes directly to us. That's the primary direct emission, uh, emission. And some of those photons will irradiate the accretion disk, the gas that's in that accretion disk. And that gas, you know, that's like regular atoms, ions. When a photon hits one of those um, atoms, it causes an electron, it excites that atom, right? It causes an electron to jump to a higher energy level. And it will decay back down eventually. And in that process of going back to its original ground state, it will release an emission line at a particular energy, at a particular wavelength. And so this is the, what the equivalent to what we're saying, bouncing the light echoing off of the accretion disk. It's really this process of photo excitation and fluorescence line emission. The other thing that makes this more complicated is that, you know, in this nice schematic here that we said where you could just map out a direct sound, one pulse of sound, a delta function pulse of sound, then it would be kind of easy to kind of map out the echoes. But it gets a little more complicated because it's not just that we see a pulse of light, a delta function flash of light. What we're actually seeing is that this black hole is varying all over the place over time. This is again one of these light curves now on much shorter time scales, looking over um, thousands of seconds. And what you see, the brightness over time is that this, instead of just a pulse, we're seeing it just fluctuating, kind of random noise. And so what we have to do is look for lags and leads in this pulsating light curve like this, this variable light curve. And in this particular tidal disruption event, what we were able to see, we found for the first time one of these emission lines, one of these fluorescence lines from reprocessing off of that accretion flow. And more than just that, we were able to see a time delay between a primary flash of that primary emitting flash and the reprocessed emission off of the accretion disk. And you can kind of see that in this light curve here, um, projected in this, in this particular way, where you see the primary variability in blue and the line, this fluorescence line responding, and sort of looks like it's, it's a little bit delayed there, in reality, we don't plot things just by overplotting these different light curves. In fact, we use kind of more sophisticated signal processing techniques in the Fourier domain. And hopefully in college, you'll learn about Fourier transforms. They're really fun. But in the end, what you find is that you see a lag, a time delay associated with that fluorescence line. And in this case, the fluorescence line um, is should be around 7 keV, 7 kilo electron volts. And we're seeing a delay of that emission, that, that iron fluorescence line of about 100 seconds. Now, if you think about, okay, 100 seconds, let's do a, like the most naive thing. And we say, we're just seeing, uh, we're seeing some flash from some region in space 
And 100 seconds later, we see another flash, a correlated variability from 100 seconds away. So it must have taken the light 100 seconds to get from point A to point B. Since, so we multiply 100 seconds by the speed of light, and we get that this point A from point B is 30 million kilometers. So this is telling us something about the size of the emitting region that this fluorescence line that from the accretion disk is coming from you know, this region within 30 million kilometers. And that may sound like a huge size, but actually when you compare it to the size of the galaxy, we're actually looking very close. We're able to probe scales very close to the central black hole. So in reality, what we do is not just multiplying 100 seconds by the speed of light. We do more sophisticated. We use these ray tracing simulations similar to the ones that, that made that black hole image from the movie Interstellar. And we use that, um, those rays to model what are the time delays that you would expect, the reverberation light echoes that you would expect in this kind of geometry to, um, you know, given the data that we see, what does that mean about, you know, the mass of the black hole that we're looking at? What does it mean about the, how fast that black hole is spinning? What is its orientation to us? We can piece together all of these things using these reverberation light echoes. And this is just a little movie that the NASA press office put together. In this particular um, title disruption event, what we think is happening is that we are seeing this really face on. We're seeing an accretion disk that's formed and it's really face on to us. And in this particular black hole, it was so, so luminous. And we think that a relativistic jet was um, punched through that accretion flow and it's pointed directly at us. And due to these special relativistic beaming effects, that's why it became so bright to us. And what we think is that we're seeing is we're able to look down into this accretion flow and we're seeing light echoes from very close to the black hole. So what you're seeing now, what you'll see in the movie is uh, this is kind of a cross-section of that accretion disk. So this is like the accretion disk is kind of like a donut. And you're seeing a cross-section of that. And those lines that you see are the relativistic jets. And we are looking kind of, our line of sight is looking down into that along the direction of those relativistic jets. So this is the, the movie have kind of echoes being produced probably from the relativistic jet, but that are bouncing off of the accretion flow. And we can use those light echoes to probe what is the geometry of this system. So stellar material is falling towards the black hole through this accretion disk along the midplane of this accretion disk. And in fact, we think that it's, I didn't talk about these details, we think that it's producing so much radiation that that radiation is pushing out a lot of material at speeds of 0.3 to 0.5 the speed of light. And we can, all of that was, um, you know, came out of these observations of these reverberation light echoes. So I'll leave it there. Uh, hopefully I've convinced you that supermassive black holes do indeed exist and they sit at the centers of galaxies. And we can get a unique look at them when we watch a star getting ripped apart and falling into that black hole. And I use these reverberation light echoes to study those innermost regions around black holes. So thanks for your time. And uh, let's take a look at, and, at, at any more questions in these last couple of minutes. Okay. So, right, how will the study of supermassive black holes help us understand the evolution of galaxies and the universe? So, my work is really trying to, you know, understand this process of, you know, how, when you throw material into the black hole, it produces these relativistic jets. These relativistic jets 
have enough power or these strong outflows from that are moving at 0.3 to 0.5 the speed of light they can you know they're moving outwards away from the black hole they're launched from they're tapping you know the the energy of the black hole you know the gravitational energy is released as material moves inwards and it that the release of energy can move out on scales very far from the black hole and can push out gas along with it and basically it means that that gas it'll heat up that gas on very large scales and it'll prevent that gas from cooling and collapsing and forming new stars so the, the black hole itself is kind of inhibiting the um, galaxy from growing stars and growing bigger and bigger and that's one idea for why they call this um, black hole feedback that you know material goes in grows the black hole but also prevents the, the galaxy uh, from growing bigger and that's kind of the idea that there's like a feedback loop between the galaxy and the black hole yeah okay Um, there is a question about, I want to become an astrophysicist or an astronomer. Awesome. Is it better to do a, a bachelor in astronomy or in physics? I would say that you cannot get around, you know, the thing about astronomy is that it uses physics from all, all different fields, right? So what did I tell you about in today's talk we talked about gravity of course but we also talked about you know atomic physics right and like all of those you know to produce those those fluorescence lines you need to understand a little bit of quantum mechanics right you need to understand how atoms behave you need to understand um, how radiation and matter interact all of these are things that are being studied in um, different fields in, in physics. And what I love about astronomy is that it really brings together, you need to have knowledge of all of these different fields in physics, particle physics, nuclear physics, gravitational physics, all of those things. Um, so I would say that getting, you know, you can't go wrong by getting a degree in physics. Um, a lot of the astronomy, like I have a degree in physics, and then a lot of the astronomy I learned along the way. You know, sometimes I took formal classes, but often I would, I just, you know, learned by doing my own reading. Um, so I don't want to discourage anyone from getting a bachelor's in astronomy because honestly, for me, those are some of my most fun classes. I really enjoyed the astronomy classes the most. But if you are going to get an astronomy degree, make sure that you're taking as many physics classes as you can. But yeah, I think you got to do what excites you, right? You got to follow the thing that that gives you motivation. Okay. How can Hawking radiation escape from a black hole? Ooh, that's a good one. These are all great questions. So one question that I get a lot is, how do black holes die or can black holes die and because you know it seems like they just get they grow they just get bigger and bigger and bigger in mass um because the only thing that can happen is that things fall into the black hole nothing can escape out but it turns out in the 1970s people started thinking about what happens when you kind of try to merge these ideas these modern physics ideas of general relativity describing gravity and quantum mechanics describing the physics of the very small things, subatomic particles. And how, what happens when you put these things together? And Stephen Hawking came up with this idea of that we now term Hawking radiation. And this is the, um, the only way that we really know of getting um, kind of black holes to will get smaller in mass. And the idea in a very general way is that let's say you have, um, you know, basically in uh, quantum mechanics, you can have the process of 
um, particles coming, electron particles and antiparticles coming even out of a vacuum. You can have, um, you know, the, the production of uh, an electron and a positron, but very quickly they will annihilate. They'll hit again and they'll annihilate and they'll they go back to, you know, not being, they'll produce, you know, a photon. And um, if you have this process of the production, this quantum mechanical fluctuation, where you have an electron and a positron forming at the close to the event horizon of the black hole, they were produced, you know, through the energy, you know, from the gravitational energy of this, of this black hole. But one of those particles, let's say one of the positron, falls into the black hole and the other one escapes to infinity. Now, basically you have, uh, you know, in, in order to conserve energy, this particle has escaped. Now you have a black hole and this extra particle. In order to conserve energy, basically it means that the black energy has come from the black hole. Mass has, you know, basically come from the black hole. So the black hole gets smaller in mass and this particle has escaped to infinity as what we call Hawking radiation. This process is very, very slow. It's not Hawking radiation is, um, causes the black holes to, to evaporate, Hold it. but the process is, is very slow. Like even a, like if a, a black hole the size of our sun, the mass of our sun, it will take 10 to the 67 years for that black hole to evaporate completely through Hawking radiation. That's like many, many orders of magnitude older than the black, than the universe itself. So it doesn't, it's not something that we think happens um, a lot, but turns out if you have a very small black hole, then it could, what we call maybe primordial black holes, those small black holes that, that were produced at the be beginnings of the universe, that we just can't really see, maybe they could evaporate on a time scale, um, produce Hawking radiation and evaporate on a time scale of as long as the universe. Um, and we may be able to see those. We have not detected that, but that's possible in the future. Anyway, um, let's see, could these supermassive black holes um, be formed in the early universe as a result of inflation or some quantum fluctuations rather than from the evolution of massive stars? Well, yeah, so we do think that quantum fluctuations like these primordial black holes that I was talking about could, um, could make um, black holes in the early universe that, um, but these are, should be very small. Um, and then the problem is even harder. You have something that's maybe um, a, mil a billion times less massive than the sun, a black hole produced from these quantum fluctuations. And now it has to go from, you know, it has to grow 20 orders of magnitude to explain these billions, 10 billion solar mass black holes instead of just, you know, 10 orders of magnitude. <laughs> So, um, yes, it's possible, like, it's thought that, that we should form, we can, we may, we may form black holes in the early universe through these quantum fluctuations, um, but they are likely not to be the seeds of the supermassive black holes that we observe today. Good question. What are some other MIT rules? <laughs> no one will tell us. I don't know. You'll have to come to MIT and, and find out. Yeah. <laughs> um, shouldn't imaging Sagittarius A star be easier than M87 since it's much closer? What a great question. So Sagittarius A star is the supermassive black hole at the center of our galaxy, and yet the uh, astronomers in the Event Horizon Telescope collaboration showed us that image of M87, which is an external galaxy, um, tens of millions of light years away. 
the thing is that actually the angular size of these um, black holes is 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 similar, or the size of the event horizons, I should say. The, bl the, the black hole itself is just a singularity and it's hidden to us by this event horizon. We can't see anything from beyond the event horizon. The Sag um, Sagittarius A star is about 4 million solar mass black hole. So it's, but M87 is about 100 times more massive than that. So it's event horizon and all of the you know, the accretion disk size scales, everything will get bigger with the bigger mass black hole. And it turns out that even though it's further away, it's easier to image because of its large mass. The other, there's other, some other more nuanced complications um, on, on why it's harder to uh, image Sag A star. In particular, one thing may be that just the accretion flow around Sag A star is actually more complicated it looks like there's a hot spot, some blob of gas orbiting the black hole that's actually going to make it more complicated to do the analysis. And, um, you know, but it's a, your question is a good one. And, you know, we were, Sag A star and M87 were the two targets that the Event Horizon Telescope were observing. Um, and I think most astronomers, and astronomers, including myself, thought that Sag A star was going to be the first one that they would image. Um, but it turns out to be a little bit more complicated and hopefully they will come out with that image in the next couple of years. Okay, so I'm, I'm cognizant that we are past the hour and I don't wanna hold you guys um, beyond, um, you know, beyond too long. Yeah, thank you so much, Erin. The sure. presentation and the questions were very interesting. Yeah, and you guys asked some amazing questions. Yeah, so I wish good luck to everyone with the rest of the competition. And uh, see you next time. Yes, good luck, everybody.